Well, welcome. I'm Gil Rosman. I taught at Princeton for over 40 years, and now I live in Washington, D.C., and edit a journal on international relations in the Asia-Pacific region. I've long been fascinated with Japan, traveling there repeatedly over half a century, and I want to share some of my thoughts about that country with you. Uh, I come at this as someone who was in a sociology uh, position, but also deeply interested in the history of Japan and in the international relations of Japan with its neighbors and with the United States. A number of questions have aroused my interest in Japan. One is, is this country converging with the United States? It was becoming, from the 1950s and 60s, modernized economically with all that brings in education and urbanization and changes in family structure. It looked like it was becoming more and more similar to what were then seen as the world leaders. It was um, a very close ally of the United States, and really there has been no period uh, since the 1950s, when Japan and the United States haven't worked well together and when Japanese public opinion hasn't been highly favorable to the United States, with, with occasional small uh, problems between the countries. Uh, it is a country that sees itself as part of the U.S. overall alliance network, and yet when one asks about convergence, is it becoming more like the United States, and does that affect its international relations, the answer has to be ambivalent. There was a strong tendency in Japan from the time I first got to know it to reject theories of convergence, to reject, reject a notion that somehow there was going to be increasing overlap between it and the United States in values. Uh, they agreed about democracy and they were very pleased that the U.S. occupation had, had strengthened and revived democracy in their country, but they were really still searching for something to establish to confirm their uniqueness. So there's never been a, 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 a kind of recognition that Japan and the United States are moving closer and closer in thinking. Uh, with regard to Japan being part of the West, well, that has been accepted generally, but at the same time there's been a, an underlying urge for Japan becoming, again, a strong factor in Asia. And the theme of Asianism in Japan is very important sometimes with linkages to justifying Japan's effort to uh, bring Asia together before 1945, as if that was undertaken under um, idealistic um, circumstances. And if you think about Asia, why they haven't really um, become so strongly present in Asia, one factor which may stand out is South Korea. The United States has two very close allies in East Asia, Japan and South Korea, yet there's been a consistent feeling that somehow Japan doesn't respect South Korea sufficiently, doesn't acknowledge its past efforts to, um, to wipe out much of South Korea's culture, to, of course, colonize South Korea and not willing to explain to the South Koreans that there can be new trust based on a more accurate understanding of the past. Another concept that is, create, creates some uncertainty about Japan is internationalism. And it's been used quite a bit in Japan as if this is something that is desirable with the understanding that the U.S. is the leader of the international community. But at the same time, uh, it's often been interpreted in narrow ways and even recognized as recently as not sufficiently appealing to the Japanese people. There's something missing 
about embrace of internationalism, whether it's a, a pacifist strain that says Japan shouldn't be part of international security agreements, somewhat changed now, but still a big struggle going on, or it's a sense that Japanese people aren't studying abroad in the numbers you see from Koreans or Chinese. They're just some kind of a, a hesitancy to, to open up to the outside world. Uh, so I want to probe beyond these uh, questions I've raised and ask, what do we need to know about Japan looking at the internal roots of its international relations to be able to grasp some of the driving forces that I suspect you will observe when you travel in that country. First, there are three leaders in Japanese post-war history that I want to single out. The first one is Yoshida, uh, Y-O-S-H-I-D-A, Yoshida Shigeru, who was the leader who accepted the U.S. occupation strengthened Japan's relationship with the United States after that occupation and became the architect of what is called the Yoshida Doctrine to uh, concentrate on economic development, economic recovery, while basking under the U.S. nuclear umbrella and sticking very close to the United States. Cultural themes were left more ambivalent under his leadership. So that's the leader of the 1950s who left a legacy that is still um, significant in Japan's situation today. The second leader, if we jump ahead three decades, is Nakasone, N-A-K-A-S-O-N-E. Uh, Nakasone Yasuhiro, during the period when he shared uh, leadership with Ronald Reagan, and they had a special relationship, the Ron Yasu relationship. And he was a leader more nationalist, more interested in capitalizing on Japan's economic miracle, as it was seen at that time, uh, what later became a so called bubble economy, uh, to strengthen ties with the U.S., but also to move more vigorously to establish Japan in Asia, not necessarily fully with uh, working closely with the United States, and at the same time tried to go back into history and initiate a rethinking of Japan's past that was at odds with the thinking of some of its neighbors and brought back some important nationalist elements. And the third leader, whose significance um, we all are recognizing now, is Abe. Um, Abe is the prime minister, has been for three and a half years, and he has, again, concentrated on strengthening ties with the United States. He's seen as a great friend of the United States, doing a lot of things the United States very much welcomes. But at the same time, gone much further than Nakasone to try to reestablish Japan as a normal country with a view of history that is what they call not masochistic. In other words, not critical in the same way as it used to be of Japan's role in the 1930s and 40s uh, in starting a war and um, creating an atmosphere where um, uh, the U.S. was attacked and we ended up finally in uh, 1945 with Japan fully defeated. As Obama gets ready to visit Hiroshima, where the U.S. dropped its first atomic bomb, uh, and go there together with Abe, and do so without apologizing, but while stressing uh, the common goal of these countries to forge a nuclear-free world and counter the nuclear threat of North Korea, uh, this interest in history of Abe is particularly relevant. Well, I look at Japan by trying to understand their national debates, um, how their newspapers and journals, both academic and popular, as well as books, at any point in time, in, demonstrate the differences of opinion and the underlying similarity 
and the way think, people think about Japan's role in the world. And so I do this with um, an interest particularly in what I call national identity. And I divide national identity into six dimensions. So I want to use those dimensions to make some comments about Japan's linkages between internal affairs and foreign policy. The first dimension is ideology. Now some would say Japan is a pragmatic country known for its mercantilism uh, through the 1980s. And there's really not much ideology there. I would argue there's been a struggle between two very different views of ideology from the 1950s. And it's still not fully resolved, although Abe is shifting the balance towards what I would call the revisionist ideology. The first ideology which dominated in the media, in the debates across Japan, but not in the political leadership on, in the Cold War era, was an ideology of pacifism. Japan reflected on its wartime losses and wanted to avoid becoming entangled in U.S. alignments, in uh, international uh, Cold War struggles. Now that began to give way at various times, uh, more and more criticism of the Soviet Union. Uh, but basically it was the overwhelming view of the people and they defended the Constitution that was implanted by the United States in 1947 which held that in Article 9 that Japan is not to uh, <clears throat> engage, in, not to have armed forces, that was reinterpreted, and not to engage in offensive uh, military actions or preparedness. And so that article is still there, and even if they keep trying to reinterpret it, as they did in the last two years with uh, a law that allows collective self-defense, uh, which gives Japan an opportunity not just to defend itself, that interpretation occurred a long time ago, but to also defend its ally, the United States. For instance, if a missile from North Korea is launched and is gonna to head towards the American mainland, Japan under this new law is now per permitted to shoot down the missile should it fly over a Japanese missile defense vehicle. Uh, but that revisionist group then it has been insisting on, uh, on revising this constitution, whereas the pacifist defenders of the national identity as they saw it beforehand are insistent on blocking any such change in the constitution. Abe is thinking about calling a double election uh, in July, there is already scheduled to be one election for the upper house of the Japanese parliament, but talk about a, a double election. And then that would make it possible if he can win the two-thirds majority, he and his uh, coalition partners, he would be in a position to revise the constitution. Uh, that is a very strong objective of Abe, whom many see as a revisionist. So if we move from the those who defended the post-war passive Japanese foreign policy and hesitated to cooperate closely with the United States, long were opposed to the uh, Japan-US alliance or wanted a minimal role for that. And we move on to the conservative revisionists who want to uh, bring Japan to what they call a normal state, revise the constitution, strengthen Japan's role as a military uh, power working with the United States, uh, or maybe eventually not, and revising thinking about history, then we come to Abe's agenda. And Abe has been, uh, has been struggling between these two elements of his uh, thinking, and I call one of them ideological. It's ideological but because there's, there's an obsession with it. 
this is something that is, it can't be compromised um, in, you know, in, in its long-term uh, objectives, even if it short-term ones can be uh, adjusted. It is an obje objective to, um, to go to the Yasukuni Shrine, where uh, not only war dead in general are, are, um, are interned, but also where war criminals, the, the main war criminals uh, who were found guilty in the Tokyo Tribunal after the war are, are there, and to pay reverence to, to them, uh, very offensive to Japan's main neighbors, and also something that President Obama uh, opposed, tried to get Abe not to go there at the end of 2014, uh, 2013, sorry, fearing that that visit would uh, do damage to uh, relations between Japan and South Korea and stir the Chinese public in a way that wouldn't be helpful for U.S. management of relations in the region. But Abe defied the U.S., went, and the U.S. criticized him for doing so. One of the two main areas of criticism <coughs> from the United States in Abe's time at return as prime minister. So that's the ideological struggle. I think the revisionists are winning, but at the same time, given problems in Japan's economy, in its, uh, where there's been a period of near stagnation for uh, 25 years after the burst of the bubble of economy, and Abe's program for economic growth has, has barely taken off while Japan's debt keeps growing to astronomical amounts, even though it's owed to people within the country, and therefore it's not seen as an, an, any kind of crisis situation, and the interest is, rates are very low. Uh, but Abe has faced a number of problems, including U.S. pressure and the need for greater U.S. cooperation. And under those circumstances, he has, I wouldn't say quite put aside his revisionist goals. More likely, he's postponed some of them, delayed vigorous pursuit of them, even as he accomplishes other goals, which are also very important to the conservative establishment in Japan and to Japan's overall national interest. Above all, building up um, the military alliance with the U.S. and establishing Japan as a more active uh, state in foreign policy, while revising textbooks and making other changes that prepare the way for, uh, <coughs> for the revisionist agenda. So ideology is one element, I think, of identity that is still being played out. The second element of identity is history. Uh, and indeed, often the ideology focuses on historical themes. But Japan is more attentive to historical issues than many in the West would recognize. Uh, whereas some of the traditions in the United States, diplomacy and public discourse, are to sort of put history aside and get on with facing the problems of today. Japan has addressed history as a fundamental factor that has to be resolved in Japanese national identity. Whether they're looking at the earlier period before 1868 or before 1853 when Admiral Perry forced open Japan after two plus centuries of self-imposed solitary confinement by the Japanese, isolating themselves from the outside world, not letting people leave Japan, not accepting foreigners in Japan except in a, a tiny island where a, a little bit of contact could take place under Dutch auspices. Um, and so the, uh, the history of Japan in that period can be seen as one as paving the way towards a more militarist outlook that led to Japan's imperialist attitudes in the 1930s and 40s, or it can be seen as some, a source of more pride, and, but also Japan turning uh, 
inward, not relying so much on the outside world, figuring out uh, development on its own. And I think that source of pride has been boosted by the, the, the revisionists wanting to see this period more positively, uh, the samurai period in Japanese history, whereas the, um, the pacifist uh, generally viewed it as, as a negative starting point for that history. But more controversial has been the history of, the, um, of Japan from the Meiji Restoration of 1868 to 1945. And this period uh, has been reconsidered a lot in recent decades, emphasizing the more positive qualities of uh, Japan uh, borrowing rapidly, the first Asian country to modernize, and to do so rapidly and catch up, winning in a war with Russia, uh, fought over Korea uh, especially, um, f forming a, uh, a somewhat modernized society very quickly. So there's a, there's a lot of possibilities for finding pride and that's what Abe and those around him have wanted to do. But when it comes to the 1930s and 40s, how does one look at this controversial period? Is this a time when Japan is really tr primarily trying to liberate Asia from imperialist, not calling Japan's behavior in Korea, for instance, imperialism? Or is it a time when Japan is imposing its own domination through force, as it was doing in China and eventually in Southeast Asia. Another period of interest is post-war Japan from 1945. And there should be a lot of pride in that period because Japan was very successful in, uh, in catching up again, sometimes double-digit rates of economic development, in maintaining order, in borrowing from the outside world, in doing many things that uh, won support from the outside world without appearing threatening, keeping a rather small armed force, uh, having a low profile, well respected in the world, or should it be seen as some of the revisionists see it as a period of um, lack of patriotism um, masochistic treatment of their own history and their own sense of self-worth. Uh, so is, there's a debate about this, and this is affects overall thinking about national identity, and that also relates to international relations. When Japan normalized relations with South Korea in 1965, it took a long time, and some Koreans were not satisfied with some of the terms, but they needed Japan's economic assistance. And then with China in 1972, although that also left many Chinese dissatisfied with um, Japan's stance on some of the historical issues and on Taiwan. And then um, uh, it kept um, moving in this period towards uh, a stronger position in the world. Was, is this a source to be a pride or is it a time to look back and say Japan really was too weak and it wasn't operating like a normal country? So these are two of the dimensions. Another dimension is how do one look at Japan's civilization and its view of itself internally? Is it a country like so many other countries, capitalist, democratic, uh, sharing universal values, uh, very much um, part of uh, an international community? Or is it a country with uh, its own type of community where harmony uh, uh, takes precedence over competition, where there's a stress on sort of a managed society with some degree of censorship and some degree of um, um, criticism of international organizations trying to operate in Japan. and. Uh, create a, a sense of international citizens except not Japanese citizens. Uh, and what does one make of the notion of Japanese civilization? Is it an independent civilization in the world 
or is it part of, um, increasingly part of a single global civilization, uh, which we could call Western civilization, but maybe it's going to be relabeled to reflect the, the, the greater breadth of it? Or is it a part of Chinese historical civilization? Well, the Japanese strongly resist that, even though in the 1990s there was a time they were trying to get Chinese to ac acknowledge a kind of shared regional East Asian community uh, with similar kind of Confucian roots uh, from Confucianism, but the Chinese decided to make Confucianism their own very distinctive pro-communist interpretation, and Japan was left very much out of this. So um, the, the Japanese have fallen back into talking about their own very different national character. Uh, they have a term for this, and they had hundreds of books written about the distinctiveness of the Japanese character uh, that builds up into a distinct national identity. And so that is a, a big part of this identity reformulation. In fact, in the 1950s, when Japan's identity was um, under siege, they, were, they had been defeated. Many of their old teams of identity were, were rejected. Uh, the revisionists hadn't yet made much of a comeback. The, the pacifist uh, critics were, 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 were denouncing a good deal of Japanese identity. It was this civilizational identity, this pride in the, the daily life, the association with nature, the, the beauties of Japanese art, the way Japanese deal with each other, and the nature of the Japanese language that helped revive a sense of strong sense of Japanese-ness and pride that later led to a pride in the Japanese economy, exaggerating its strength until the bubble burst, and pride in the Japanese society and management, which provided for more harmonious linkages between family, firm, and state than Western societies, which in particular the United States was held up as a country that had many more problems than Japan did at that time. Well, those are some of the issues of national identity. Um, I would argue that if you go to one dimension, how intense Japanese identity is, you would find that it is, uh, it reached a peak. There was a kind of spike in the late 1980s when there was this pride in the economics Japan was going to be first in the world economically. Pride in the reemergence of Japan as a political power, now able to speak its voice, for instance, at the G7 meetings with the other industrial capitalist powers. And so there was a sense of pride in Japanese culture mixed with achievements. Uh, but, but that spike was damaged by the collapse of the bubble economy, by political um, uh, instability as one prime minister after another came and went, uh, by a lack of Japanese clout in Asia, by China surpassing Japan economically and as the, the dominant country in Asia whose voice is, 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 is easily heard. Uh, so Japan is struggling again to reestablish pride and strength in its national identity, to rebuild the spike Abe speaks of a beautiful Japan, that he's the leader who can do it, and uh, his foreign policy is one part of that. So I want to concentrate on three parts of Japanese foreign policy in the remainder of my remarks. The first is Japan's relations with South Korea. In the Obama period, the relationship between Japan and South Korea has been a big problem for the U.S. We want integrated missile defense. The two could not cooperate because of their struggle over history issues, particularly the so-called comfort women. The Japanese um, uh, coerced or uh, the Japanese revisionists say um, uh, motivated, um, rewarded uh, sex slaves uh, during world, the, the war. 
who served the Japanese, and Korea still has about 45 of them alive and has sought compensation before they die in a way that the Japanese government has to take full responsibility. And the president of Korea, Park Geun Hye, uh, ha ha has made this a particularly strong issue. But the problem is Abe and the revisionists in Japan were no less strong in insisting that even the way this issue had been handled in the 1990s was a sign of Japanese weakness and was not consistent with their interpretation of the uh, reemergence of a normal Japan. So this struggle lasted until December 28, 2015, when finally an agreement was reached between Abe and Park on how this issue would be handled, how Japan would pay compensation, how Korea would stop criticizing Japan in international forums in the United States, the history war would, would be over, how the two would go on past this issue. But Koreans weren't very happy with that settlement. The majority are, are against it. A statue outside the Japanese embassy erected on private property by Koreans has not been taken down uh, in this agreement. Uh, President Park said she would endeavor to take it down. She would try to take it down. And some in, the, in, Japan, in Japan are saying before they fulfill all the terms of, on their side, they must see the Koreans actually take down this statue. It's proving very controversial in Korea to do that. And meanwhile, some in Japan, some of the staunch revisionists, regard this as a compromise by Abe that he's been one of many he's made on history issues and, and, and they just, they, they're not happy with it. Uh, they think he should have stood stronger uh, against uh, South Korean criticisms, but they, um, because Abe is so much on their side, they've generally given him the benefit of the doubt and not, uh, not stood against him. But this agreement is very important because it was regarded as a test of Obama's rebalance to Asia. Could he bring his two main Asian allies together so they would work together in dealing with the challenges of the region, China's rise, particularly North Korea? And although there's only uh, partial success on that, there's been a big improvement in security cooperation dealing with the Korean Peninsula and dealing with missile defense uh, and in intelligence sharing uh, since that December 28th agreement. The U.S. worked very hard for that agreement. That is a major success in Obama's foreign policy to get these two allies uh, who were struggling with each other so much. And they managed to push Abe towards a realist foreign policy where he understood that Korea would be a vital partner in dealing with the challenges of Asia rather than a revisionist foreign policy where South Korea was seen as a threat to the reinterpretation of Japan's history uh, and that, that would make it hard for the revisionists to realize their, their goals. So that is the Korea issue. We, we, we can't be confident that that relationship is, is really uh, firm right now, but at least we can say it's significantly changed. And the North Korean nuclear test in January and long-range missile test in February helped make South Koreans more aware of the importance of trilateral security cooperation with the United States and Japan. The second issue I want to talk about is Russia. Um, if Japanese-U.S. relations were strained by the Yasukuni Shrine visit of Abe and by the Korea issue, right now they're strained most of all by Abe's determination to improve relations with Russia uh, in the hope that he can get a peace agreement never signed in 1956, although they normalized relations with, with the Soviet Union, a peace agreement that would uh, re allow for the return of two or more of the four islands in dispute with, with, uh, since the end of the war. And so Abe is making overtures to Russia, but uh, the 
The uh, United States doesn't like that because it could undermine the sanctions regime introduced after the Ukraine and Crimean uh, aggressive moves by Russia. And so Obama at various times has appealed to Abe, don't make a deal with Russia that will, um, that will endanger the sanctions regime. Uh, and, but Abe just a few days ago, uh, from when I'm giving this presentation on May 8th, um, met with um, Putin in Sochi and um, again tried to come up with an upbeat interpretation of how Japan and Russia could work together and how significant this was, not just for territorial returns, but also geopolitically. And finally, I'll, I'll close my remarks by talking about U.S.-Japan relations a little. I think this is a very strong, close relationship, supported by public and the public in both countries. And although you get some in Japan fearing that the U in U.S. will entrap Japan in some type of conflict that they, their pacifist leaning still uh, object to, and some in the United States saying Japan isn't paying its full share. Um, that they should be doing, being mo doing more, even though they pay a very substantial amount, I think more than any other country does, for U.S. military uh, cooperation and bases. But right now, the relationship is going strong. Abe's visits to the United States have been very successful. Obama's about to go to Japan, and we anticipate a very successful visit from him. The, Japan really hopes the G7 meetings can be a success and demonstrate Abe's leadership. But a lot depends on how, how much they agree on the big security challenges. And those are primarily the South China Sea, which Japan cares about no less than the United States. It's the lifeline for Japanese trade. The, um, the rise of China's military, including in the East China Sea, uh, the North Korean nuclear threat and missile threat, uh, Japan would add the unresolved issue of Japanese citizens abducted mostly from the, the shores, the beaches of Japan, for instance, walking home from school when a North Korean submarine would show up uh, 30 years ago and kidnap uh, someone who just disappeared. No one had any idea what happened until North Korea confessed in order to improve relations with Japan in 2002, uh, but that confession turned out to be uh, a source of new frustration because the Japanese didn't believe that they got much of the information. They still think there may be uh, kidnapped people alive in North Korea. They haven't had the story of what, what really happened to these people. Uh, they got five, a small number of them back, uh, but that, that, that hasn't resolve the issue at all. So if the U.S. and Japan can cooperate on these issues and regard our alliance as strong on all of these challenges, and I would add, unlike the Japanese, on Russia's reassertion, uh, including building up its military on the disputed islands that Japan wants back, uh, reassertion of its military clout in East Asia, and even some support for North Korea, uh, against South Korea. If we don't get um, uh, consensus on these issues, it'll be difficult for the U.S.-Japan alliance to keep strengthening as it has. But my guess is we will get consensus, that the Japanese won't find a way to move forward with Russia as they had intended. Uh, they will build on the agreement with South Korea to the U.S.'s satisfaction, even though there'll be some further tensions over time. They will strongly support the action in the South China Sea and the East China Sea, where Japan's hold over the island of Senkak, or the rock where nobody lives called Senkak, which the Chinese call Diaoyu, is in question. And the United States is supporting Japan even though we don't take a stance on the territorial dispute. If all of those things hold, even as Abe keeps moving somewhat in a revisionist direction, this realist Abe will be seen as 
the dominant force, that he's working to create a better security environment along with the United States in this region and trying to establish a more coordinated set of alliances and partnerships, including much stronger ties with Australia, new ties with some of the countries in Southeast Asia, such as the Philippines and Vietnam and Singapore, and even ties to India, where Abe's made a special point of trying to strengthen the relationship between Japan and India. If all of those things happen, and the Japanese national identity discussion remains roughly as it, is, as it has been, without a sharp tilt towards uh, a revisionist end, I think the U.S.-Japan relationship is going to strengthen further. This is the main partnership for Washington in dealing with China in across Asia, and I think this will, um, uh, you'll find in Japan a lot of public goodwill for working with the United States and respecting the ties between Japan and the United States that have been fostered in the 70 years since the war. I wish you a good journey.